Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I am Monica Inkovet, Director of Programs and Partnerships at the Steve Fund. I am very excited to introduce today's conversation, Confronting Imposter Phenomenon. This is something that I myself have struggled with throughout my career. So I am so grateful to Dr. Copley for naming this and offering us this opportunity to hear his suggestions and his resources. Before we get started, I want to tell you about the Steve Fund. Steve Fund is a national organization dedicated to the mental health and well being of students of color. Our vision is that every young person of color is supported by programs, services, and institutional cultures that value and promote their mental health and emotional well being. Please visit our website, stevefund.org. For today's conversations, we have two of our Steve Fund mental health experts. Dr. Kevin Coakley will present and Dr. David Rivera will moderate the Q&A session. Please use the chat to send your questions. Little background on Dr. David Rivera. He is an associate professor of counselor education at Queens College, City University of New York. He received his doctorate in counseling psychology from Teachers College, Columbia University. His professional experience includes college counseling, higher education administration, and consultations on DEI issues. His latest co-edited books, Affirming LGBTQ Plus Students in Higher Education and Critical Theories of School Psychology and Counseling, a Foundation for Equity and Inclusion in School-Based Practice will be released in late 2021. I will now introduce uh, Dr. Kevin Copley. Dr. Copley is a fellow of the University of Texas System and University of Texas Academy, Ac Academy of Distinguished Teachers and the chair of the Department of Educational Psychology. He is also a professor in the Department of African and African Diaspora Studies. His research and teaching can be broadly categorized in the area of African-American psychology with a focus on racial identity and understanding the psychological and environmental factors that impact African-American students' academic achievement. Dr. Copley studies the psychosocial experiences of African-American students and students of color and is currently exploring the imposter phenomenon and its relationship to mental health and academic outcomes. He was elected to fellow status in the American Psychological Association for his contributions to ethnic minority psychology and counseling psychology. And he holds the title of Distinguished Psychologist from the Association of Black Psychologists. He is the recipient of the Charles and Shirley Thomas Award for mentoring ethnic minority students from Society for the Psychological Study of Culture, Ethnicity, and Race. It is my pleasure to pass the mic over to Dr. Coakley. Thank you so much for that very nice introduction. Well, it is my honor um, to be able to speak to you all today about a topic that is very important, uh, confronting the imposter phenomenon. And I hope that um, through this talk, you will be able to better understand what this um, phenomenon is and what we can do about it. So just a word um, quickly about the Steve Fund. Um, as has been mentioned, the Steve Fund is the nation's leading organization focused on supporting the mental health and emotional well-being of young people of color. I, I have been really pleased to be associated with the Steve Fund um, for a number of years. Um, I, I believe their work is incredibly important. Um, it is not often that you find organizations um, that are really committed solely you know, to focusing on mental health issues for our youth of color, and the Steve Fund does this. Um, its vision is that every young person of color is fully supported by programs, services, and institutional cultures that value promote their mental health and emotional well-being. So on that note, let us get started. The imposter phenomenon, what, what do we mean by this term? The imposter phenomenon is the experience among academically or professionally successful individuals of feeling like intellectual frauds. It's, it's the idea that individuals who are, who are very accomplished, um, very competent, very intelligent um, individuals 
Nevertheless, they feel in some ways fake. They feel fraudulent. They feel like if people could peer into the, the windows of their soul, that they would see that they aren't nearly as, as competent as they come across. So these are the individuals who, who are smart. They, and they've proven themselves to be very capable individuals, but they still feel vulnerable. They still feel like they are intellectually fraudulent. And if we were meeting in person, uh, one of the things that I would ask you is, by, by show of hands, how many of you uh, have ever felt at any point during the course of your life like an imposter? And it, you know, typically what will happen is I'll, I would be in a room and I would see a lot of hands being raised. And, and typically it would be the majority of hands that would be raised. And what we know from, from research is that it has been estimated that, that up to 70% of people have experienced feelings of imposterism. I would actually um, say that it's, it's higher than that. Every time I have given a presentation and when I've asked people to, to raise their hands if they've identified or, or if they've ever felt like an imposter, um, I would say somewhere between 80 to 90% of the hands are typically raised when I ask that question. So, so we know that this is a very common feeling experienced by a number of people. So how is this imposter phenomenon created? Um, there's a combination of both internal factors and an external environment. Let's turn our attention to internal factors. So what ends up happening is, is that, that we end up um, sort of throughout the course of our life internalizing messages about being competent in areas um, not related to intelligence. So for example, if you are very socially skilled, um, you know, you might begin to believe that, you know, you are, you know, you are that person who is, you know, popular in various social settings. Um, perhaps, you know, you find yourself to be athletic and you have received a lot of messages um, um, complimenting you about your athletic prowess. Um, so you receive these sort of messages about other areas of competence, um, but you don't tend to receive messages about your intelligence. So when when you can repeatedly receive those messages about other areas not related to your intelligence, then you start to internalize, well, maybe, maybe I'm not that smart. You know, maybe I need to just sort of embrace these other areas that people are always commenting on. And of course, this is linked to your own sort of self-doubt uh, about your intelligence. Um, if you are re receiving reinforcing messages about being smart, then you begin to internalize that maybe you're not as smart as you believe yourself to be. And then of course, this is linked to having overall sort of a lower self-esteem about yourself because I think most people, I think it's safe to say that most people would like to believe that they are smart or that they you know, have some you know, amount of, of intelligence and to not ever be told that, you know, you are smart, you are accomplished, you, you know, if you're not, to not receive those sort of messages can have a, an effect on one's self-esteem. So, so those are the internal factors. And then there is the external environment. Uh, being in environments that are incredibly competitive, um, where, you know, it's sort of like, you know, you know, you're always sort of placed in situations where you are competing against um, someone else. Those sorts of environments, you know, sort of foster feelings of imposterism. Um, similarly, and I, I guess sort of linked to those competitive environments, being in situations that are sort of high pressure, high stakes, um, which typically you, you will find in more competitive environments. Being told that you're superior and yet you're struggling to meet expectations. So, so this is sort of a, a, a different um, sort of notion, you know, where you actually are given these messages about, you know, let's say, you know, you're very intelligent, um, you, you know, you're given all of these sort of messages about your supposed superiority, and yet you are finding yourself still struggling to meet, you know, certain expectations. And then, of course, you know, being a, a numerical minority, when you're in an environment where there aren't many people who look like you, and it could be based on a number of different factors, you know, race, ethnicity, gender, uh, et cetera, when you find yourself being a minority in, in an environment, that can also help sort of foster feelings of imposterism. So it's a combination of these internal factors and the external environment that help create these imposter feelings. 
And it, clinically, in terms of what psychologists and or other mental health professionals uh, will observe, um, we observe that individuals, you know, will report feeling overvalued by their colleagues and friends um, when you know you receive you know these sort of complimentary um, comments, and you feel like you know you're not really deserving of these comments. You feel overvalued to a certain extent. Um, so we will see people sort of reporting feeling overvalued. Um, of course, believing themselves to not be intelligent is a common observation that we make. Um, having no experience of an internal sense of success. Um, so these are individuals who, who really report, they just have a difficult time truly believing in their success. And what is particularly notable is that repeated successes uh, will not break the cycle. So, you know, again, you could be someone who has, you know, made good grades, um, who has done well in these different areas related to school. And yet these repeated successes still don't result in you not feeling at times like an imposter. Um, you will also see sometimes individuals who believe themselves to have been mistakenly admitted to graduate or professional school or feel lucky to have gotten a job. I, I can remember when I was a student and I was applying to graduate school when I received, and at that time, you know, we, we didn't just receive emails, we received, you know, actual sort of letters. I remember receiving a letter indicating that I had been accepted to, to graduate school. And yes, I was excited, but part of me kind of felt like, is this really happening? Like, did they make a mistake? Because I, it was so hard for me to believe that, that a graduate school really believed enough in, in me and what I had done to offer me admission. And so just not fully even wanted to accept that. Um, and, and you'll see this reported by people who think that, well, maybe it was a mistake, you know, or I just got lucky or whatever the case may be. So these are some of the observations that we make around individuals who, who report feeling like an imposter. And then there is this cycle um, that is pretty common um, to individuals who experience impossible feelings. And I'll, I'd like to walk you through this cycle. So let's say we started with a project or a task. Um, since I'm talking, I think, to, to students, let's say that you have either a test that's coming up or there's some other um, class project that you have to um, get done. So you, you're thinking about this, this test or this project or task. Um, it's causing you a little bit of anxiety. You know, you're, you're, you're feeling a little bit of self-doubt, you know, wondering or hoping that you can do well, but not knowing if you're going to be able to do well or not. And there are two typical paths that individuals um, who experience impossible feelings will take. There's the path of over-preparation and there's the path of procrastination. Now, the path of over-preparation, and this is one that I can identify with very much, the path of over-preparation is one where an individual will prepare endlessly um, for this task or this test or this, pro this, this, this project. So if I use myself as an example, I have given countless numbers of, of talks on the imposter phenomenon. Um, you know, people consider me to be an expert um, in this topic. So you would think that I could just roll out of bed and just sort of give the talk, um, you know, with no preparation at all. But that's not how I roll. Um, I still prepare each time like I have never given the talk before. And I've been teased about that. Like, you know, why are you spending so much time preparing for a talk that you've given so many times? But this is what the over preparer does. So the over preparer goes through all this and then um, hopefully, you know, will feel a sense of accomplishment once they've completed it. Um, there's a feeling of relief. And hopefully they will receive positive feedback that they've done a good job. But then they will sometimes discount that positive feedback and they will discount that positive feedback. And, and what I mean by that is, is that they will attribute it to effort. You know, the, so for the over-preparer, they will say, well, the only reason I was able to do, you know, well is because I just worked really, really hard. I had to, you know, prepare for hours and hours and hours. Uh, and it's not that they, it's not that they are an expert, you know, so in, again, using myself as an example, it's not that I'm an expert. I should know this stuff. It's that I just attribute it to, I just prepared so much. So that's a way of, in some ways, almost discounting that positive feedback. So then there is the path of procrastination. Um, these are the individuals 
who have a test or a project or task that is, is, is due, and they just keep putting it off. Like they, they know the, the due date, they know when it's supposed to be sort of submitted, um, and they have the time to do it, but they just keep putting it off or and keep putting it off. And they wait until the last minute. Now, I don't know if, if this happens as much today. You know, when I was in school, people used to cram for tests and they would sometimes wait until a night or two before a test or an exam and just pull, you know, like all nighters is what we call them. But these are the individuals who sort of procrastinate. They wait until the last minute before they do something. So finally, you know, they wait till the last minute, they, they prepare, and then there's this, you know, accomplishment. Um, they have a feeling of relief that they they got through this. Um, hopefully, they will receive some positive feedback. You know, in terms of maybe getting good grades on on the the, the project or task or whatever the case is, and then they will discount this positive feedback and they will attribute it simply to luck. And they'll say, "Look, you know, you know, I was only able to do well just just by luck." Um, you know, again, they don't believe that it's it's because they're, they were actually really smart and, and they couldn't have done it if they weren't, you know, had a, if they didn't have a certain level of intelligence, they just attribute it to just luck. So whether you are an over preparer or a procrastinator, you sort of have this, you go through this cycle and, and you sort of attribute, you know, your success to things outside of your own intelligence and competence. And this will lead to um, individuals continuing to sort of feel like they are fraudulent. Um, feeling, you know, increased self-doubt. And these are sort of the more extreme cases. It can ultimately lead to depression or anxiety because you you just have an inability to just accept or internalize the fact that you really are intelligent, you really are competent. And then the cycle will start um, in some cases all over again. So this is what we call the imposter cycle. Uh, Maya Angelou, and I, you know, I love using this example because I was a student at Wake Forest University. That's where I graduated. Maya Angelou was a you know very famous professor who was teaching at, at Wake Forest University at the time that I was there. Um, you know, one of the greatest uh, poets you know of our time, and she said, "quote I have written eleven books, but each time I think, uh oh, they're going to find me out now. I've run a game on everybody, and they're going to find me out." And it's like you're Maya Angelou. Why would you ever feel? like an imposter. And yet we know that she did, in fact, feel like an imposter. Um, our former first lady, Michelle Obama, um, this has described on multiple occasions some of the battles that she's had with imposter phenomena. And I'd like to play for you this clip. To enter into an elite school when your high school counselor has told you no, you're not good enough, when, I, when all of society sort of looks at kids of color or kids from uh, poor communities or rural communities as not belonging. Uh, you know, I, like many others, walked into that school with a stigma in my own head. Uh, more young people nowadays call it imposter uh, syndrome. I don't know if they call it that in, in Britain where uh, kids like me feel like they don't belong. And I had to work to overcome that question that I always ask myself, am I good enough? And I write about that. That's a question that has dogged me for a good part of my life. Um, am I good enough to have all of this? Am I good enough to be the first lady of the United States? And I think that many women and definitely many young girls of all backgrounds walk around with that question. But how I overcame that is how I overcome anything, hard work. So whenever I doubted myself, I, I, I just told myself, let me put my head down and do the work and I would let my work speak for itself. Uh, and I still find that I do that. I still feel that at some level, I have something to prove because of the color of my skin, because of the shape of my body, because of who knows how people are judging me. And this is really, I think, a, a profound comment by Michelle Obama, because think about it. She, She's an Ivy League trained lawyer. So she has proven herself academically. And yet she still has found herself battling with feelings of um, the imposter phenomenon. Another example of someone that you may be familiar with. 
Now with that surprise revelation from Viola Davis, the new Oscar winner telling Amy just moments after that, yeah. that she suffers from something that a lot of women do. It's surprising, but yeah. then if you really think about it, a lot of women are in the same boat that Viola Davis is, and it's something millions of Americans face, where despite all of your success, you sometimes feel like a fraud. Viola revealing that she struggles with it as well, so take a look. She's now an Oscar award-winning actress. And the Oscar goes to Viola Davis. I became an artist and thank God I did because we are the only profession that celebrates what it means to live a life. High achievements, but like many, Davis still battles with doubts as she revealed backstage after the Oscars. Tell me how that feels. And it feels like my hard work has paid off, but at the same time, I still have the imposter you know, syndrome. That term, imposter syndrome, is a concept psychologists coined for feeling a sense of phoniness despite evidence of high achievement. I still feel like, you know, I'm going to wake up and everybody's going to see me for the hack I am. You know, I still feel like when I walk on the set that I'm starting from scratch until I realize, okay, I do know what I'm doing. I'm human. Some researchers estimate at least 70% of people will experience this imposter phenomenon, and some believe it affects more women than men. I know I'm not the best, but I'm proud of myself. This is the first year I've allowed myself just a little bit to see that to realize that self-deprecation is not the answer to humility. That sometimes you could say, I deserve it. That I'm proud of myself and move on. Well, thank you, Amy, for bringing that to us. And joining us now is psychiatrist, Dr. Janet Taylor. So and I, I love this clip, uh, Viola Davis. I mean, she is such an incredibly accomplished actress. And yet we hear from her that even someone as accomplished as her still feels and struggles with these feelings of the imposter phenomena, or as some people call it, the imposter syndrome. And so this hopefully, I think, conveys to you just the, the normality, the pervasiveness, if you will, of these feelings. And we know that imposter feelings um, exist among young people of color. And in, and, and in my own work, part of what I try to do is to really sort of reconceptualize or, or sort of to think differently about the imposter phenomenon through a more culturally appropriate lens. Um, I do that because my work, as was mentioned in my biography, has focused a lot on um, African-American students and students of color. And I understand that what students of color, you know, oftentimes go through um, is different than what their majority peers go through. Young people of color sometimes struggle with feeling like they belong um, because of racial hostility that they experience in um, these sort of predominantly white spaces, um, because of feelings of uh, marginalization, um, being marginalized. Um, and I, I can tell you stories about students um, feeling like, or not feeling like, but actually sort of, you know, being marginalized, you know, when it comes to sort of, you know, working in groups, class assignments, et cetera. Um, and then, of course, you know, um, being discriminated against. And so, so what young people of color go through in these predominantly white educational spaces is, is, is different than what their white peers will go through. And so for me, you, you need to sort of understand imposter feelings among young, young people of color through this lens. And so this, this, this existential question of do I belong is a question that um, I think students of color oftentimes ask themselves. These experiences can challenge students of color's sense of intellectual belonging and can contribute to them feeling less competent and less prepared for school. And of course, we know that all of these are some of the features of the imposter phenomenon. And we know that there's also a link between the imposter um, phenomenon, imposter feelings, and mental health. Um, individuals who, who have um, high imposter feelings um, have expressed or, or, or oftentimes show symptoms of depression, generalized anxiety, and low self-esteem. Um, we know that high imposter feelings have been linked to poor mental health and increased levels of depression and anxiety among ethnic minority students. This is what I found in some of my own work. So, so what are the strategies to overcome imposter feelings? There's, there's several that I'd like to share with you. One, document your successes. Now, why is this important? It's important because too often we, we minimize um, the successes that we've had, or we don't pay attention to the successes. And so what we suggest to people is, is that, you know what, um, keep a diary, for example. When you've done something well um, each week, 
you know, just make a note of that and then revisit that so that you can remind yourself that you actually did well on that test or did well on that project or received some other accolade, document these successes. And then relatedly, own your accomplishments. Um, you know, sometimes I think people feel like they can't really own their accomplishments or even talk about them because they don't want to be uh, perceived to be sort of braggadocious. And, you know, it's, and certainly, you know, I, I can understand not wanting to, to turn off people that way, but there's a fine line between sort of, you know, that person who's always bragging about themselves versus someone who's just, who acknowledges, you know what, I, this is sort of what I've done and this, and I'm proud of it. I think you can own your accomplishments without being someone who turns off people by um, appearing to be sort of just braggadocious. So own your accomplishments. And when you are experiencing these imposter feelings, talk to a colleague or friend. Why is this important? Um, because you'll oftentimes find that you are likely not alone. Um, oftentimes people will suffer in silence. They don't wanna talk about their feelings of, 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 of imposterism because they don't want to uh, show their vulnerability to people. Um, but you'd be surprised in talking to a colleague or a friend that they might, they might report themselves that they've had the same feelings. And so what it does is it normalizes for you that you're not alone. Learn from your mistakes. We are not perfect. And, and, and I think sometimes what ends up happening is, is that we, we feel like an imposter is because we have made mistakes or because we're not perfect, but it's okay. No one is perfect. So take your mistakes and learn from them and don't let them, uh, don't let the mistakes define you. And then of course, as a psychologist, I have to say, seek treatment for, for mental health. For some people, um, their imposter feelings are so, so disabling that they need to seek professional help. So I, I would always suggest to people seek treatment for mental health. Um, it is very, very important. And so again, I, I share um, some resources here. Um, you know, these are interviews that I've done, um, articles that have you know, been written about the imposter phenomenon. And so hopefully you will find them helpful. And I want to thank you for your, your, your attention. And Dr. Coakley, I'm not sure if I'm coming on clearly. Yes, hello, <laughs> Dr. Rivera. Good, good to see you. And I, I do wanna reflect that one of the first times we met was when the Steep Fund was just barely forming at Brown in 2014, when you were sharing some of the very life-saving knowledge that you were gifting us with today. And I just really wanna thank you for how much you've broken down this concept of imposter phenomenon for us, especially the young people visit, um, that are viewing us right now. In my own work on racial healing, I've been centering internalized oppression and imposter phenomenon in particular, and I draw upon your work for uh, teaching uh, young people how to navigate these issues. So thank you for that. You know, we have um, one question that came through um, is asking us to kind of delineate or asking you, um, what is the relationship between stereotype threat and imposter phenomenon? <laughs> I, Dr. Rivera, I can't tell you how many times that question is asked. Uh, okay. it, it is, uh, and, and people sometimes will conflate the two. So I, I think that's a that's a really good question. I, I'll try not to be too intellectual about it. Um, but if we think about Claude Steele's um, stereotype threat, you know, it's 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 the the idea that that individuals uh, are are aware of stereotypes that exist about their particular social identity group, whether it's based on sort of race, gender, or et cetera. And, and, and the awareness of the stereotypes that are associated with your group, um, you know, results in sort of causing you to sort of underperform relative to what your abilities would suggest. And so, you know, you know, take for example, you know, you know, being a woman, for example, in, in, a, in a math class or stimulated class, and, and you are, a very good um, sort of person, you know, to do math, but you are aware that sometimes that there are stereotypes that exist about women and, and, and their mathematics performance. And so underperforming in that class, uh, because you are aware of the stereotypes that exist about being a woman. So, so, so the, so stereotype threat, part of what ends up happening is, is that, that you are aware of the stereotypes that you don't necessarily internalize it. You, you might not believe it. You don't believe what people sort of, stereotype your group, social identity group to be, but because of your awareness of it, it then undermines and disrupts your performance. The imposter phenomena, you actually have internalized sort of beliefs about your incompetence or lack thereof. You know, you 
you believe that even though you have been accomplished, you believe that you are fraudulent. So, so the difference between imposter phenomena and stereotype threat is that with the imposter phenomena, you have internalized these sort of beliefs about yourself. With stereotype threat, you don't necessarily internalize it, but your awareness of it then sort of undermines your performance. Does that make sense? Makes a complete sense, right? And I think I am really glad that you delineated between the two because they really are two distinct phenomena, right? That maybe are cut from the same cloth, so to speak, but have different um, processes for how we experience them as people and then for how they then manifest or what might trigger them as well. Yeah. Another question came in, can we talk a bit more between the connection and differences between imposter phenomenon and perfectionism? Uh, so in, in my own in, empirical research, I have actually um, included perfectionism, I and mean, more specifically what has been referred to as maladaptive perfectionism, um, because, you know, perfectionism takes on sort of different types. You know, you, you can be, you know, someone who has what is called more adaptive perfectionism um, that, that does not sort of rely on having these unrealistic expectations for, for your performance. And so, yeah, so um, perfectionism or more specifically maladaptive perfectionism um, is very much associated with imposter feelings. Um, in fact, you, you'll find them that they are quite often linked together. Um, and, and it's interesting because I think in the original sort of uh, theorization or conceptualization, I, I don't know that um, Suzanne I Iams and Pauline Clance spoke explicitly uh, about perfectionism as much as perhaps they could have, but we know certainly through research that, that perfectionism or maladaptive perfectionism is very much associated with imposter feeling. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Coakley, for uh, answering that one as well. Yeah, that I also hear um, when I talk about uh, imposter phenomenon um, that everybody has kind of imposterisms, right, going on for them in some kind of way. Um, I think it's important that we delineate between the everyday um, uh, imposterisms that anybody might have in terms of feeling like a fraud and the imposter phenomenon as we understand it for marginalized folks, especially people of color. Can we tease that out a bit more in terms of the, the generalized uh, things that people? Yeah, no, that, 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 no, that's that's a really great, great question. Um, it, it is it is true. I mean, you know, I, I shared with you this statistic earlier um, that, you know, 70%, and I believe it's actually much higher um, based on my, just anecdotally, um, that, that most people will, you know, indicate that they have had imposter feelings at some point in time. But, but to your point, uh, Dr. Rivera, that's different, I think, than, than the sort of, uh, sort of daily sort of sustained, sort of the, the internalized and racialized. I, I think that's the point that I really want to emphasize, the racialized forms of imposterism that that are especially damaging to students of color so when i'm when i'm talking with students and, and i have a room you know that in, include both sort of white students and students of color and you know and white students will talk about feeling like an imposter uh, it's true they they do feel like imposters but what i try to sort of explain to them is that they don't feel like imposters um, typically because of the color of their skin. They don't feel like posters because of not feeling like necessarily they belong because people have sort of stereotyped them as, as not belonging. They're, they're imposter. So if, if we think about sort of like the difference between so the unit of analysis, if you will, the unit of analysis oftentimes for, for white students is, is, is the individual. So they have imposter feelings that's, that's, that's more rooted in the classical definition and understanding of imposterism. What I'm proposing is that for students of color, the classical definition of, of, of imposterism doesn't quite fit because oftentimes their, their imposterism feelings is linked explicitly to questions of sort of, do I belong? Um, being sort of stereotyped as not belonging, as being less intelligent than, and, and being aware of that and then sort of in, 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 internalizing that. So, so there really are some differences. Um, and so I would say that, you know, to not confuse, you know, an experience of, you know, everyone has imposterism to the particular racialized form of imposter feelings that students of color um, frequently have. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Thanks so much. <clears throat> so, so there's some questions coming in and there's some that have kind of a similar thread to them. <clears throat> 
I think um, folks are kind of asking, or maybe they're not, maybe this is sort of mine as well, but we know that our institutions, our colleges and universities are to blame for a lot of the situations that induce this um, imposter phenomenon with BIPOC students in particular. And part of what I think we need to be doing is like flipping the script on who's actually ill, right? Which is why I'm actually, I'm really happy that we started calling it phenomenon as opposed to syndrome, help yes. pathologize the student, right? This wasn't theirs to own, right? This is the oppressor's kind of worldview being inserted into the student's mind or the young person's mind. But our institutions do that so frequently. I'm wondering if we can talk a little bit about how institutions yes. kind of propagate imposter phenomenon. I know that that is a wonderful question. In fact, I was just um, I was part of a program by uh, the National Academies of Science, Engineering um, and, and Math um, a couple of weeks ago, and I had invited someone to, to participate with me, um, a professor named Dr. Ebony McGee. Um, you're probably familiar with her at, at Vanderbilt University. And and what she has done is, is really interesting. Um, so what she has said is, look, um, don't don't call it the imposter phenomenon. Call it what it is. It's racism. And she so she she has a really interesting take. Um, it, her thing is that that students of color wouldn't feel like imposters, but for the fact that they are in very racist environments that make them feel that way. So so her argument is, look, it's it's not. This is by calling it imposter feelings. You're putting the onus on the students, like it, it's something inside of them that that they need to sort of work on, and 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 you know maybe they can they can meditate them, themselves out of it. You know, she's not a psychologist, so she's she's a little bit uh, you know uh, sort of flip with with some of her comments. But I I understand what she's saying that she's she's like, you know, I mean we we just we approach it from different vantage points. So her she would say it's the environment that's that's causing students to feel like. It's the, it's the environment that's sick. It's the environment that needs to be addressed, not students of color. And I acknowledge that, which is why I say, you know, that, that it's racialized imposterism. And I agree that the environment has to be addressed absolutely. Um, but as a psychologist, I also want to sort of give agency to individuals. So I think it's a, it's a, it's not an either or, or it's a both and. But but you're absolutely right that 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 environments, you know, that continue to 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 perpetuate. Um, sort of feelings of uh, not belonging. I, I, I'll give classic examples. I, I spoke to a, um, a department um, of, of scientists um, maybe a few weeks ago, and I gave them an example. I said, you know, you know, I, I give a lot of these talks, and I was asked to give a talk, an imposterism talk for a student group. I think it was maybe engineering. And after the talk, I had um, a, a black student, a black female student, approach me, and she said, Dr. Copley. I, what you said really sort of resonated with me, and 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 it resonated with me because I have been in situations, you know, in classes where there have been assignments, there have been like, you know, these these groups um, that have been put, you know, that that have to sort of do assignments, and I will try to find a group, and and she says, and, and quite frankly, you know, I've had you know white students and Asian students exclude me um, because they don't think I'm smart enough to be in their group, and so what I sort of explained to to the professors you know, that, that I speak to is look, you need to be aware that these dynamics are real. This is not a, this is not just sort of an, uh, an aberrant sort of phenomenon. This this happens frequently, and so so professors need to be aware of these sort of environmental stressors uh, for for you know certain BIPOC students, and they then they need to sort of address that and, and do some and do and do something to ensure that that sort of thing can't happen um, because that. Um, exacerbates um, feelings of imposterism. It should not be the case that 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 certain BIPOC students um, are excluded from opportunities to sort of participate and to learn and to grow um, because of whatever pre preconceived notions people might have about them. So so yes, you know there very much needs to be work done in the environments themselves that are largely responsible for for really exacerbating feelings of imposterism amongst um, certain BIPOC students. Mm -hmm. kind of very similarly related. <clears throat> so we, we know that the institutions are causing damage, so we know that they need to be rebuilt, quite frankly. Students need to be supported because they're already experiencing the, the manifestations and the impacts of it. Um, but what we, someone is asking is that they, they, they uh, kind of come into the situation where students are sometimes, because of their imposter phenomenon, it's kind of impacting their ability to seek help, right? Especially from their professors, right? They may be trying to put up a front, if you will, with how 
how they are as a, in terms of combating imposter phenomenon. So we'll, what, what are some thoughts about what we can do, what students can do to kind of get through that? But I really believe it's on the onus of professors like us, or not even like us, but those that aren't talking about well, it, what can, what can happen? It, no, it, it is. I mean, and so I, I'll, I'll tell you what, what I do, um, and then folks can sort of see if it might work for them. But I am very transparent in my in my in my life journey, and 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 you know, so I wrote a book called the the, the myth of um, you know anti intellectualism, you know, and it, it was a book that was meant to sort of challenge the notion that that black students you know don't care about school and don't value school. And in that book, you know, I particularly I think in the introduction, I talk about my own schooling experiences, and and I talk about you know some of the early struggles and challenges that I had. And it's important for, for all students, but it, it's especially important for BIPOC students to hear stories like mine, because what ends up happening is, is that they, they see a Dr. Kevin Copley and they, they perhaps put me on a pedestal and they imagine that I've never had any academic struggles that, that I've coasted throughout my entire life being a straight A student and just always sort of being on the, at the top of my game. And that nothing could be further from the truth. And so, so it's, I, it's my responsibility I think to to share openly with my, with students that I come into contact with and that I teach that that has not been my story that I have struggled that I had that I I had imposter feelings when I didn't know what imposter feelings were when I was an undergraduate student so the example that you just gave about that student not going and and talking to their professors and asking for help that was me mm -hmm. that was me at Wake Forest University um, that freshman that first semester. I had an absolutely horrible start to my career. Here it was someone coming from a small town, um, small high school. Um, my high, the highest math that I had, you know, available to me was trigonometry. I was competing against students who were coming from well-resourced schools where they had calculus one and two, and they had the advanced classes that I didn't have, you know, exposure to. And so I was competing with those students. First semester, it was. It was miserable. I I did very very poorly, and I was immediately placed on academic probation. And yet, I did not feel comfortable, you know, having like sustained conversations with my professors. I think I, I might have had maybe one conversation. I think I had with a, a black male biology professor um, because I was really struggling in biology. And, and even though I wasn't in his class, you know, he was a black professor, and I thought, well, you know, maybe he can like you know help me. But but outside of that one conversation, and this is one conversation throughout you know four years of school, I, I didn't have conversations because part of me was ashamed. I, I felt like, you know, if you you were smart enough, you shouldn't need to have these conversations with your professor. You should just be able to to get it and do well. So so I think that professors that we need to to be transparent with our students about our own processes. Now, of course, if you're that person who, ne who has never struggled, if you, if you, in fact, made straight A's, never received a bad grade in your life, you might not be the person, best person suited to talk to the individual. But assuming that you, assuming that you are not that perfect person, share with students your own stories. They really, really appreciate it. I just experienced so much mirroring from what you just shared. I can definitely uh, relate to that experience of not knowing what this was as an undergraduate student and now being able to make sense of why I was isolated. I didn't leave my, my dorm room hardly ever my first year. I missed so many classes and barely squeaked through with, uh, with passing. But I completely agree, uh, Dr. Copley, that um, especially professors, I think that one thing that we can do, we can gift our students is transparency with what our experience has been like. You know, I think you know, people see our biographies, our CVs, and they've been cleaned up purposefully, right? <laughs> Very purposefully. <laughs> um, but there's so many details in there that go into the narrative of how we got to where we are and what goes into our daily process. I still go through the whole kind of rigor rigmarole of before I give a talk, let me talk myself up, right? Now, I know I have a PhD from an Ivy League institution, but I still question my intellect on a daily basis. Um, but so I'm not sure if we have like the magical answers, but I think that definitely being more transparent is helpful and can go a lot a long way. You know, someone asks the question about um, also, um, you know, we provide the support to students um, and we, we try to enforce how worthy they are being in our institutions and in our classes. And as faculty of color, you know, we're also struggling with very similar dynamics. 
And um, so the question was, how can we own it ourselves? I think that you gave the answer about uh, sharing, right, um, transparently with uh, with students about our experiences. Yeah, and, and, and Dr. Rivera, let me let me tell you, I it took me a long time to 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 get comfortable sharing at that level. I, so when I so when I wrote when I wrote my book, um, the myth of black, uh, the myth of anti intellectualism, I I went back and forth about how much I how much personal details I wanted to share about my own sort of academic journey. Um, and, and I and I struggled with it because again, it, it has to be it has to be the imposterism because I, I didn't I, I thought to myself, if you if you share so openly with the world about your early academic struggles, then it's going to cause people to look at you and, and and wonder how it was that you ever became a professor. How is it that you had sort of gotten to this point? And then people are going to like dismiss you or just think, you know, just sort of see you as just a, an affirmative action sort of, you know, um, sort of baby is, is a term that used to be used. And so I went back and forth on that. And then finally, you know, I got to the point where I said, you know what, if as a, a tenured full professor and not just full professor, but as, you know, an endowed professor, you know, if, if I can't now at this point in my career feel comfortable sharing my story, then when will I ever be able to do that? Like, I mean, it just, I just, I had to come to the, to the realization that, that it was my responsibility to do that. And that my, what I've accomplished at, up to this point, if that doesn't sort of, you know, garner for me some level of, you know, acceptance of respect, then, then nothing will. But more important than that, I need to share my story with people who, need to hear it and who might be able to identify with it and who might be inspired by it. Mm -hmm. Might be somewhat healed by it, right? By understanding that there, this is a common experience and even the most distinguished of professors endure it. And so that can open up so many doors, right? For somebody who is built or closed in so many ways because of the weight of imposter phenomenon. Now we only have, I think about nine minutes left. This has been a great conversation. I feel like I'm just getting a lot out of it personally by by chatting with you. Um, one, this one uh, question, and I kind of have heard this, and I think I've been the product of this um, probably even to my current day, but you know, the common advice, fake it till you make it. Is that part of the problem? I guess <laughs> all students that fake it till you make it? That, that, that is part of the problem. So the imposter phenomena, the, you know, the, the sort of the, the term that's really popular is, you know, imposter syndrome. And, and as you sort of alluded to, like, we, we I, tend to not use the imposter syndrome because of its clinical sort of overtones and that's not the way that it was used originally in the literature but but what what has ended up happening with the imposter phenomena is that it's it's a very sort of uh, pop psychology type of topic that's very popular like you you can google imposter phenomenon imposter syndrome and there are all sorts of experts out there you know who've written books who've given talks i mean they, they're all over the place and and one of the things and one of the um, sort of recommendations that I've seen come from some of these sources is fake it till you make it. Um, and you know, I don't particularly like that piece of advice. Um, although you know, some people find it to be useful um, because you don't need to fake it because you you because by 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 endorsing that you're almost you're you're buying into this idea that it's not really who you are that. And I don't want to. I don't want to sort of give power to that. Um, you, you shouldn't be faking anything because you are intelligent. You are accomplished. You are competent. You don't need to fake anything. You you need to believe that about yourself, but you don't need to fake it. And so I just I don't subscribe to that fake it till you make it sort of idea. Completely agree. We should get rid of it <clears throat> unless you really are a faker. But um, we're not talking about fakers here. Uh, <laughs> maybe one more question uh, to round out our time. And this is uh, specifically for white faculty and staff. Um, we've been talking about maybe what we can do as faculty of color by sharing our stories. But as a white faculty or staff uh, person that, that is uh, commenting in the chat, um, what might they do to help students who are struggling with imposter phenomenon? Well, I mean, I don't. I don't know that my advice is all that different for them because, and I know white faculty, you know, who have also talked about their own challenges and experiences. I mean, it's not like they live charmed, perfect lives. They've had their own sort of experiences and 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 self doubts, 
And so I would I would say to them what I say to faculty of color, and that is be transparent about your own experience. I mean, you know, it, I think, in fact, I think it's unfair to think that white faculty, you know, have had a, you know, this sort of perfect, you know, sort of academic experience themselves and have not ever had any of their own sort of struggles. Mm -hmm. uh, I just think that, you know, it, they may have been socialized that it's not okay to sort of, I, I don't know if this, if, this, if this is the case or not, but they may have been socialized to be less comfortable with sharing that about themselves. I think as people of color, I think oftentimes we understand the, the power of sharing the story, the story about our experiences for people that look like us, for them to hear. And maybe white faculty haven't been socialized in the same way, but I would say to them, no, when working with um, students of color, you cannot underestimate how powerful it is for them to hear your story and your feelings of, of you know, imposterism that you have perhaps have struggled with or, or dealt with. So I, my advice would essentially be the same for them. And, and, and beyond that, to sort of name it and to, to always, you know, when working with students of color, you need to always affirm your belief in their potentiality and your belief in their competence and your belief in their intelligence. They need to hear that from you, yeah. um, particularly when they're getting so many other external messages to the contrary. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And, I, and I, I agree with calling it out when it happens in my own classes. If I hear a student self-doubting themselves when they give an answer, I automatically say that sounds like that's imposter phenomenon speaking. I'd rather know what you have to say about this. Right. So it's a kind of way you can you can play with it in a way where you're teaching about it. And through that consciousness raising alone, that can be a, an intervention that can help to interfere that imposter phenomenon just enough so that the student can actually be as present as they'd like to be and share their intellect as it's meant to be shared. Yeah. Well, thanks Thank so much, Dr. Coakley, for uh, taking some time out of your busy schedule to share about this very important topic. I know I'm walking away definitely uh, much, uh, um, much more blessed than before, and I'm sure that our participants are as well. No, thank you so much. And I, I apologize I didn't get to go through all the chat comments, but I, I do want to give a shout out. I see an old friend of mine, Dr. Nita Tawari. I don't know if she's still on there, but I just want to give her a shout out. Uh, someone that I've known for many, many years. We both were very much influenced by Dr. Joseph White, someone who has been, you know, an incredibly powerful influence for so many, um, you know, BIPOC individuals. Uh, but I want to thank everyone for, for attending. Um, I, I hope that there was something in my presentation that was of use um, for you in, in the work um, that you all are going to be engaging in. Thank you so much. Um, we totally appreciate you both, and and I, I have to say that I am I'm walking away totally inspired by both of you. So thank you for sharing um, your time and your expertise. We really appreciate it. And to all of you um, who joined us. Um, please sign up for our newsletter, um, check out our websites for other resources that the Steve Fund has to offer. Um, and this event is being recorded, so please share it um, with other people who couldn't join us. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>